Um, thank you very much, Yanis Zeros, for your, for your wonderful introduction, and thank you all for coming and being here this evening um, to hear me. Uh, also to Katerina Zepi in the Athens Center for um, inviting me to give this talk and all their wonderful pre uh, preparations to Angela Kiosoglu, whose idea it was in the first place, and Jonathan who also helped out, and, and also, of course, my publisher, uh, Moses and Rahil Kapon, who are here this evening, uh, and who produced a very beautiful Greek edition of my book. And uh, no less my uh, literary agent, Evangelia Avloniti, who was coming up, uh, I'm not, she, she's, she's here, um, whose work and enthusiasm for my writing started this whole thing going. Uh, and uh, Vaso Sutiriu, who has been working tirelessly uh, uh, with grace and empathy uh, on my behalf as well. <clears throat> so, um, the experience of exile uh, in ancient times and today. Um, I have chosen to talk to you here this evening around this subject of exile as firstly the condition affects a vast number of people in the world today. The United Nations has quoted the figure of 65 million. And may I point out <clears throat> that it is not only it not only impacts on the uprooted, but also their hosts who receive them. And secondly, because I'm well versed with the experience, uh, since I and my life have been fundamentally shaped by it, and I have thought deeply about it and written about it in my books. Uh, my Innocent Absence, which has been translated into the Greek exile on three continents, I tell it my life of experiences of, uh, and experiences of continual uh, moving, starting from infancy, uh, as a springboard to explore the nature of memory and identity and reflect on some of the complexities of human behavior and relationship. In my more recent book, An Unfinished Portrait, which isn't available yet in Greek, I delve more deeply into my mother's life uh, and the turbulent world she experienced as a young woman leading up to and between the two wars, when radical new ideologies and discoveries in the world of science and the mind, as well as a novel way of expressing these in the visual arts, music, dance, and theater, were undergoing a huge upheaval. In the midst of all this, people were being torn out from their ancestral surroundings then, that went back many centuries. And I myself was just starting life. Exile signifies loss of home and all one has grown accustomed to and encounters in one's everyday experience and the search and start of a new life, while still mourning and grieving for all that has been left behind. With time, growing insights, and a firm resolve, these memories may be instilled into one's being as a past to be remembered, but no longer craved for, while at the same time opening one's heart and vision to make room for the new. That is to turn the experience of exile to best advantage. The writer, Salman Rushdie, spoke of exile as a state of constant becoming, which disposes of fixed truths. And I'd like to focus on this as I go along. As to myself, I'm the product of multiple exiles or uprooting. I was born in a foreign land from a mother and father who themselves had already been uprooted, my mother from Nazi Germany, and my father is a child from a small rural village in Lithuania to the crowded high-rise blocks of New York. And my mother and father ended up meeting in Spain, where I was born, and by the age of 11, I had escaped two wars, crossed a sea and two oceans, and lived in three very different continents. Human, ex human displacement is happening on a vast scale again today. A tsunami of refugees seeking shelter and safety and a new life in Europe 
from the chaos and the killing and destruction going on in the Middle East and parts of Africa today, with Greece in its unique geographical location as the eastern gate to Europe, with its extensive coastlines and the easily crossed borders, the receiver, passageway, and often final destination for these uh, migrants. 62,000 are said to be stranded in Greece with all the complex economic and social repercussions that this raises and needs solving. Uprooting and migration have formed part of the human condition since the beginning of history, and its experience across the, age, across the ages is remarkably similar. I'd like to show you some images to illustrate this. This photograph was taken by a photographer friend of my mother uh, of a crowd of Spanish refugees stopping over in the French village of Collure near the Spanish border when we were fleeing from the Spanish Civil War. And um, this was me in Collure. I have um, retained a vivid memory of the column of refugees passing by our lodging. Our lodging. This um, photograph um, bears an extraordinary resemblance uh, to this biblical painting of the Israelites forced out of their homeland and exiled to Babylon. Another image uh, uh, captured uh, of the refugees in Collioure from Franco's Savage War in Spain in 1938 could almost be superimposed on the photograph of the masses of refugees fleeing from Azad and Daesh in 2015. We might also compare this scene from the, um, uh, evoked from the Bible's account of the flight of the Israelites from the kingdom of Judah to Babylon to this other photograph of today's exodus from the Middle East into Europe to Greece. Though the paths through the desert have changed to the sealed roads of today, the pictures have not changed much. The same recurring images of the war-driven homeless uh, in search of shelter and safety across the ages. Tales of banishment and exile in foreign lands are told in other ancient texts dating from a similar period uh, in antiquity as the Bible. Uh, the Sanskrit epic poem, the Ramayana, tells of Rama's years of exile following his banishment by the king, his father. Along with the Mahabharata, it is a central work in Hindu literature. This is one of the illustrations in a manuscript kept in the British Museum. The equally ancient Finnish Kalevala also tells of long journeys and complicated adventures far from home by its principal characters. An epic in verse collected from oral folklore down the ages, which has become the national saga of Finland. And of course, from Greece, the Odyssey tells of the many years of homeless wanderings of Ulysses on his return home in Ithaca after the Trojan War. These four great ancient texts, uh, which cover much of the known world of the time, as distinct as they are in detail from each other, all follow a similar tale of long journeys, much homesickness, and seemingly endless, complicated, and difficult exploits and adventures. But we shall move forward in time uh, to the Middle Ages, and we find Dante Alighieri, banished from his native home in Florence, writing the Divine Comedy in his, in his many years of exile. As deeply unhappy and homesick as he was, he left us with his great work entirely written during his life in exile and because of it. As well as inspiring the journeys he describes through hell and purgatory, it also conveys his ascendancy over his personal calamity, crowned by his ultimate enlightenment he finds in paradise, which has been allegorically interpreted 
as the soul's journey towards God. Uprooting then, if, um, if survived and overcome, may also lead to much gain, increased insights, and a broader and ultimately enriching experience. It has, in many instances, sharpened creativity and stimulated the imagination. And there are endless examples of great works of literature and of the arts, film and theatre, science and medicine, which have emerged from it. One need only look at many of the refugees who fled from the Second World War, who took their knowledge and skills from the world they left behind and applied them in their new adopted country, making significant contributions to its life and culture. Which brings me back to my story, from the historical to the personal. My mother, Kete, who is um, the small middle uh, girl in the middle, was one of the four brothers and sisters with the very common names of Kete, Lotte, standing next to her, Fritz on the right, and Hans. So they were Kete, Lotte, Prince, and Hans. They had grown up in Germany in pleasant, peaceful, and orderly circumstances. Though ethnically Jewish, the family had long adapted across many generations to the German way of life and customs. Then came World War I, and the confused period that followed it, along with the growing anti-Semitism, led Fritz, um, this young man in the on the right there, uh, to delve into his Jewish roots and go to Palestine in the 1920s, from where he helped many others escape Europe, leading up to during World War II. Hans, in contrast, who's standing at the top at the end, was a musician. He became the conductor of the Hamburg State Opera at a very young age. In fact, he was the youngest conductor in the country's history. And then the management were forced to dismiss him when the Nazis took over, and he sought refuge across the border in Holland. My aunt Lotte settled in Florence, in Italy, there's a young girl on the side there, to leave once again when Hitler and Mussolini joined forces uh, and to go to the other end of the world in New Zealand. And Kete, my mother, the little young one at the bottom, uh, after Spain and France, ended up in Mexico. So the four siblings started life, who started life in a cohesive, happy, settled family life in Germany, ended in Palestine, Holland, Mexico, and New Zealand. Here is my mother and me looking happy in an idyllic wooded village where I started life just outside Barcelona. But when Franco's armies were closing in, my mother's anti-fascist activities obliged her to cross the border into France with me, a two-year-old by then. And this, this is, again, myself at that time, two years old in Collioure, where I remember the long files of refugees in the photos I showed you trekking along the coast, uh, along the coast road past our gate. And I'll just read you uh, a bit uh, of my memories of this. If you remember, I was just very, very small, a two-year-old, and I was watching all this. Our kitchen in Collioure was a simple workbench in a short passageway. And I remember my mother bent over the workshop making sandwiches and taking them out through the garden to the gate and back again to the kitchen for more, to distribute it among the people walking past our house in an interminable slow column. She always threw herself into this activity with an intense sense of purpose, lending it a peculiar importance, uh, as I saw it uh, as a, from a child's view. This time, as I stood watching her at work, she handed me a jug of milk and said to take it out, to take it out while she buttered more bread. A flush of excitement gripped me as I stepped up from mere observer in these events to active participant 
and a tremendous sense of my usefulness, small as I was, swept through me. I went to the gate holding the jug of milk very tightly in front of me as though it was the most precious thing in the world and lifted it up towards the crowd. Someone took it from me and passed it to a gaunt looking man with dark burning eyes who pressed it against his lips and took two feverish gulps. He then lifted it high to pass it over their heads to someone else. This person did the same. I watched, puzzled, as the jug passed from one to another, each time to someone pointed out by those who were nearest as being in particular need. Yet, even so, no one taking more than one or two mouthfuls. I wondered, why don't they drink it all up if they're so thirsty? So, that's uh, my vivid memory of this column of refugees at the time uh, who had passed, uh, gone through the um, border from Spain uh, into France. Um, and, ah oh yes, then here we will go on to the next slide here. As you can see, the change from the previous happy photograph of my mother and myself, and this one, which gives an idea of what we had lived through in between. We are posing here for this photograph in Marseille, in France, for the travel document my mother had struggled to obtain, uh, which certified us as stateless to seek safety in Mexico after three years of moving from place to place, evading the Vichy French authorities and the occupying Germans. Here we are, finally, on our way to Mexico on the Portuguese steamship the Serpapinto. My mother, the tall one in the back, myself and a new friend, Molly Steimer. The Serpapinto was crammed full of refugees. It carried 1,000 of us, which was well in excess of its capacity for 600 passengers. We crossed the Atlantic with renowned writers, historians, philosophers, artists, and other politically engaged figures escaping from every corner of Europe, uh, some of whom became lifelong friends. <coughs> Molly had at one time been convicted and imprisoned for her political beliefs. And she sent out this poem from her prison cell. You cannot sol solve the eagle's tail, nor limit thought's dominion. You cannot put ideas in jail. You can't deport opinion. In Mexico, uh, Molly's lifelong partner, Senia Fleshin, they were uh, Russian, they were committed Russian anarchists, became a renowned photographer. He took this <coughs> photograph of me when I was six years old. And uh, as you see, I had regained my composure and I was getting on with the business of uh, learning to live in this new country. And I shall read you another piece here of, um, we had just arrived in Mexico. My mother had two jobs, a night job and a day job. Um, my mother was out every day until late and I looked after myself until she came in. I was six by now. Um, she taught me how to fry an egg so I could have a bite to eat when I came home from school. As I left myself into the flat, I looked forward to going into our tiny kitchen and practicing my new skill. I followed my mother's instructions to the letter, taking care not to spill things or burn myself. I liked the trickiest part of cracking the eggshell on the rim of the pan and dropping its contents into the hot oil. I would watch with fascination how the clear mucus turned white around the rich plump orange yolk in the middle and then carefully slide it into my plate. I finally buttered a piece of toast and, uh, of bread and sat down in my, to, uh, to my snack with relish. Eggs had always been a favorite. So, as you see, um, I was learning to be self-sufficient at an early age. I went through primary school in Mexico City and towards the end of the war, my father was released from a German detention camp and joined us. He moved my mother and I to a small village, maybe the rent was more affordable, in Acapancingo. Um,
I enjoyed my long daily walk from Akapansingo to Nancy's school. Past the penitentiary, I turned into a leafy lane with a villa and swimming pool, which I loved to stop and look at, and continued down the middle of the empty road under the lush foliage of the tall mango trees, singing my latest favorite Mexican song. The route took me through the next village onto the long stretch of woods near the old railway line. Here I liked clambering up and walking on the rails, where I once came across a snake, but never a train. I, lived, I finally came out onto the main road by the Casino de la Selva. I don't know any of you who've read um, uh, Malcolm Lowry's Under the Volcano, which takes place around this Casino de la Selva. From where I reached Nancy's, opposite the wild open ground with a muddy pool, the tree, and the horse's dead carcass. So now this was my life in Mexico. Uh, um, at this time, um, where are we here? Uh, just at that, at that time, my mother decided to do, join the sister in New Zealand when my pa parents' relationship broke down for the last time. And this is in contrast to the last piece I, re I read to you, Christchurch. Uh, an American once said of Christchurch, New Zealand, that it is half the size of the Boston Cemetery and twice as dead. <laughs> when I first arrived, I was struck by its orderliness. Box-like family homes with corrugated tin roofs, neatly lined regular streets, their well-kept lawns scattered with shrubs and bushes and bordered with pretty flowers. And everyone had a bicycle here. They were ridden everywhere with their baskets hanging from their handlebars, stacked with shopping and school bags, dogs or any other thing. Bicycles were left leaning against the wall or a fence, unguarded and unlocked while people did their shopping. And to my surprise, the bicycles were still there when they came out. I mean, this was the change of cultures from Mexico to New Zealand. So um, I, I decided to study medicine. Uh, I, 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 also, uh, I was actually going through a difficult time here, uh, which I'll just um, read about if I can find it here. Um, yeah, uh, the first year in New Zealand, I cried. I would disappear into the room I shared with my mother and small sister in my aunt's house and sit alone on my bed and cry. I miss the music and the color, the sun, food, and smells of Mexico. I couldn't connect with the people here. They were nice. They were friendly and hospitable. But there was no real, real meeting point with them. And my mother, who was the only thread of continuity in all these changes, was too busy. Uh, busy at work, or when she was home, uh, with her sister, whom she hadn't seen in a long time. I had as well been cut off from my own language, that which represented the world around me and which I used to express myself and connect with others. And as I struggled to adjust to my new surroundings, all my new experiences and sense of alienation were in English. For me, English became a cold language, a language inextricably linked with the repression of all I felt and mustn't express. My passion, myself, were on the way to becoming the casualties. But um, yes, I, I, um, I decided to study medicine as a means of trying to help heal all the oops, so much pain and suffering in the world. Um, I was accepted into a medical school against fierce competition, and I began to find myself again. This is. My first year at medical school, which in fact, uh, Angela here is the daughter of my anatomy professor there, which was absolutely a yeah, wonderful man. After five every evening, at the end of a day of lectures and dissection, uh, which was overlooked by Professor Adams, 
and I would return past the university and across the Leith River back to my room. I would put on a record while I cooked and settled down to my meal. Later, friends might drop in for a chat. Or I might, I might go out for a walk and amble along leafy Leith Street and watch the moonlight drenching Dunedin's sleepy roofs and bouncing off the leaves of the trees as they gently stirred on their branches or sparkling in shattered reflections on the river's rippling waters. Its myriad silvery fragments bobbing and tossing on the river below. One full radiant moon poised in the sky above. I too, like the moon, filled the whole of me, felt my oneness. The divisions were illusionary, the shards restored in this illumined stillness. So, um, and then um, after qualifying, this is a picture of myself uh, in accident and emergency department in an Auckland hospital, enjoying tending to the sick and injured. And then I took another boat to Europe in search of my roots. I had sailed across the Atlantic from France to Mexico when I was five, and across the Pacific Ocean to New Zealand when I was 11. And now I was completing the circle across uh, the Indian Ocean and up through the Red and Mediterranean Seas. On the invitation of my uncle, Fritz, who had, uh, as you remember, gone to Palestine, which by now had, been, had become Israel, I spent time in Israel to ex explore my Jewish background. I worked for a year at the University Hospital in Jerusalem and then moved, moved on to Europe with my first stop in Greece, a country whose ancient history with its seeds of democracy and the worth of the individual and the importance and value of freedom and autonomy both resonated with me and fascinated me. Um, this is some of what I found. This is all. Bit. Like the Maya in Mexico and the Israelites in the Middle East, the ancient Greeks also intrigued me. Where the Maya were a people engulfed in mystery, magic, and mathematics, and the Israelites wandrers and staunch survivors who relied on a single god, the Greeks appeared an open, discursive people. Here the tall, mighty marble columns of the Parthenon alternated with air and light, and the Caryatids looked down from their perch on the Acropolis with human grace. I wandered through the hillside remains of Agamemnon's fortress in Mykonae and gazed at the great amphitheatre in Epidaurus. In Delphi, the cool, fresh mountain forests Oracular shrines, temples, and amphitheaters were all bathed in an infusion of honeyed light. In the coastal town of Norpia and in the Peloponnese, I left my handbag unattended on the beach while I swam in the sea. Such was the sense of trust the people here inspired. And in a small village down the coast, an old woman, all covered in black, invited me in my brief bikini into her humble home for a brief coffee and an exchange of the most basic information about each other through gestures and much laughing. I was beginning to sense here in Greece that the value is after all one of common humanity. The exuberance of life, bold sensuality, human warmth, and importantly, inclusivity here were drawing me to a more comfortable universal sense of my identity. Um, then I came, um, I, I finally uh, made my way to London where I specialized and worked in a teaching hospital and married an artist uh, and had two daughters. This is my marriage uh, to Rudolf Portocrux. He worked um, with those who know of him, the painter and teacher uh, Kokoschka, Oskar Kokoschka, and became his assistant b before I knew him. He stood for our seeking, uh, not having had a home and roots of my own, 
uh, he, he, he stood for the human values in his art and his teaching um, and rejection uh, of all the things uh, alienating and inhuman um, and embrace the caring, uh, his embracement of caring, compassion and responsibility, all of which he uh, uh, taught and, this, and uh, painted. This is um, a school in, that he opened in Italy uh, um, and uh, this is um, one of his paintings, a sample of his works, The Blind Leading the Blind, a comment on much of humanity which has driven history uh, and goes on in the world today. I would say almost that the first man, although he doesn't have the orange hair, could almost look a little bit like Donald Trump. <laughs> Towards my retirement, I started translating the works of an Argentine author, uh, which I had come across in the Andes, who fascinated me. These are the two books. Uh, I translated, and in the process of translating his literature, I was reconnected with my Mexican past, and my Spanish and English selves finally became integrated, making me uh, acutely conscious of the role of language and identity. Um, I have... Um, to venture into other worlds, Abandon ourselves to their wonder, open up a new vision, enrich ourselves with the fruits of cultures not our own, and in turn to drive, to delve back into our own world with a new light, see it through different lenses, the multiple fragmented world of those who have been moved across countries and cultures, each inner world interlocked with its language, and within one language, still more worlds. And so I go on and, uh, and uh, uh, reflect on um, uh, my observations of language and identity, which I, um, which I discovered while I was translating. After a lifetime of wandering and living in so many different lands, uh, to which I try to adjust, sometimes more easily than, than others less, I finally fulfilled my promise to myself on my first visit to Greece to return and find a home here where East and West meet and fuse, uh, with its ancient tradition, uh, a welcome to the foreigner and a valuing of the individual, uh, and where I feel fully comfortable and at ease, just being myself. Um, and this is here my home uh, in the Castro, on top of the Hora. Um, and I, uh, this is from my new book, which I write partly from Cerebus and partly from London. Here the sky soars into a deep, unending blue, dissolving into the receding void over and beyond. The empty, rocky landscape towers everywhere, stark and craggy, and the sea stretches out into sparkling, crystalline aquamarine. Here and there, sporadic villages display their sunlit clusters of white cubes nestling on the side of a mountain or looking down from the edge of a precipitous rock face. The principal one, Hora, cascades from the top of a conical hill down towards the port like a shimmering white bridal veil. Across the Aegean Sea, wars have been raging one after another from the start of human history. People have been fighting over their diverse ethnicities and religions, ancient and renewed rivalries, and never-ending territorial disputes for enforced control and subjugation, or an elusive freedom and choice in their lives. Here on this island, with its vast watery moat keeping at bay all that human confusion and animosity across the waves, I concentrate on my more immediate reality, in this tranquil spot, far removed from those timeless conflicts, I immerse myself instead in the stark, uncorrupted beauty all around me. I experience at close hand the raw elements of earth, rocks, sea, and sky, and wind, a fierce, howling, unrelenting wind, 
indubitably to be venting God's exasperation with us as it gusts, shudders, and blasts across the island, sometimes for days and weeks on end. And when it finally subsides, the sun glows down softly, the air shines crystal clean and clear, the warmth glories in a gentle breeze, the peace perfect. So, um, yeah, the uh, writer, D.H. Lawrence, after a lifetime searching for a place to belong or feel at home in, finally wrote, one can no longer say, I'm a stranger everywhere, only everywhere I'm at home. Your home is where you make it, a place where you can be yourself. This is my home in London by the River Thames. And my view in Serifos in the early morning as the sun starts to rise. And I leave you with this image of this remote beach on Serifos where one can commune in peace and nature and with the God of the sea, for Salem. And I shall just read you this last piece. Here in Tatiyalos, there is a small white church on raised ground, a simple taberna uh, that serves its own homegrown pro produce on its terrace overlooking the sea, and three small coves. We head towards the third on our right. As we reach the end of the goat track where it turns into a steep descent, we, pa we pause for a moment to look down at the pristine empty beach covered in white pebbles and